William Walker Atkinson's The New Psychology, Its Message, Principles, and Practice. Chapter 8 was Perception. This is Chapter 9, Mental Paths. There is a tendency of the mind to tread the beaten paths of mental activity. It is always easier to do a thing the second time, to think of a thought again, to follow a mental path once traveled over. And the oftener we tread the old path, the easier does it become to go over it again. Unless under the direct control of the will, the mind follows the line of the least resistance, and consequently it instinctively moves toward the old path. This tendency is the cause of that which we know as habit. Habit is at the same time the greatest blessing, and yet the greatest curse to man. Desirable habits cultivated give the character a bend in the right direction, and render the proper course the easiest, and consequently the one instinctively selected, but for the same reason. Bad habits make it easier for the person to follow the mental path created by them. Therefore, the formation of mental paths becomes an important matter, and one upon which the new psychology lays special stress. Dumont has well expressed this truth when he says, Everyone knows how a garment, after having been worn a certain time, clings to the shape of the body better than when it was new. There has been a change in the tissue, and this change is a new habit of cohesion. A lock works better after being used some time. At the outset, more force was required to overcome certain roughness in the mechanism. The overcoming the resistance is a phenomenon of habit. It is less trouble to fold a paper when it has been folded already. And just so in the nervous system, the impressions of outer objects fashion for themselves more and more appropriate paths. And these vital phenomena recur under similar excitements from without when they have been interrupted for some time. Maudsley says, If an act became no easier after being done several times, if the careful direction of consciousness were necessary to its accomplishment on each occasion, it is evident that the activity of a lifetime might be confined to one or two deeds, that no progress could take place in development. A man might be occupied all day in dressing and undressing himself. The attitude of the body would absorb all his attention and energy, the washing of his hands or the fastening of a button would be as much would be excuse me as difficult to him on each occasion as to the child on his first trial and he would furthermore be completely exhausted by his exertions think of the pains necessary to teach a child to stand of the many efforts it must make and of the ease with which it at last stands unconscious of any effort for while secondary automatic acts are accomplished with comparatively little weariness in this regard, approaching the organic movements or the original reflex movements, the conscious effort of the will soon produces exhaustion. All psychologists recognize the effects of acquired habits of motion, thought, and even of feeling. They all agree in the fact that habits long indulged in and allowed to become second nature may become so firmly lodged in the subconscious mind that they require the strongest efforts of the will to dislodge them. Some even go so far as to say that such habits may successfully defy the will. And at first glance, this may seem to be so. But the new psychology shows that the subconsciousness may be trained so that the habits may be neutralized and eradicated, as we shall see a little later on. Kay believed that habits and practices that have been long indulged in may set at a defiance any power of the will that can be brought against them. But he was not aware that while they might defy the ordinary will, they might be fought on their own plane, the subconscious, and neutralized by the cultivation of new habits, with a comparatively small exertion of the will. The philosophers and moralists have ever lamented the baneful power of undesirable habits and have written and preached on the subject. Beecher said, there is a wrong philosophy in supposing that a habit which has fixed itself in the fleshy nature can be overcome by the mere exertion of the will. It is not enough to resolve against it. You cannot vanquish it by the power of a resolution. To that must be added continuous training. Archbishop Wheatley said, Whatever a man may inwardly think, 
and with perfect sincerity say, you cannot fully depend upon his conduct until you know how he has been accustomed to act. For continued action is like a continued stream of water, which wears for itself a channel that it will not be easily turned from. St. Paul said, I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind. The good that I would, I do not. But the evil that I would not, that I do. To will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I know not. But it is useless to modify, multiply, excuse me, to multiply quotations, or to fill pages explaining the power of habit for good or evil. Everyone has had the actual experience of this action of the mind. What is needed is not so much to know that, that habit is, or what it is, as how to overcome and to master it. <clears throat> Excuse me. The new psychology brushes aside the old technical explanations and the theories regarding habit. It sees in habit the activities and phenomena of the subconsciousness and therefore meets it on that plane. It realizes that all actions, ideas, or mental activities of any kind tend to pass from the control of the voluntary field of action onto the subconscious or involuntary plane. The mental path is a part of the subconscious mind, and that region dominates the greater part of our mental life. Therefore, instead of attacking the subconsciousness with the will, a long and heartbreaking task, we advise the neutralizing of the subconscious habit impressions by building up a new set of impressions directly opposed to the old ones that we wish to be rid of. In other words, we kill out the old habits by building up new ones of an opposing or opposite nature. We fight to the negative with the positive. We proceed to build a new mental paths and then travel over them as often as possible so that in the end, they become the easier for the mind to travel over than the old ones, particularly if we avoid using the old ones as much as possible. The whole theory and practice may be summed up in these words, make new mental paths and to travel over them as often as possible. The following rules will be found useful in cultivating the new mental path, whether it be desired for its own sake or else for the purpose of neutralizing an undesirable habit. Number one, form a mental picture in your imagination of the physical expressions of the desired habit. That is, try to see yourself as you will appear when the new habit is acquired. Imagine how you will look, talk, and act. The firmer and clearer this mental image, the better will be the manifestation. The principle is that whatever is to be expressed in action must first exist in the mind. So make the correct mental pattern. Cultivate this habit of seeing yourself as you wish to be. It sets a good example for your subconsciousness to follow. Number two, having formed a mental pattern of the physical expressions accompanying the desired habit, proceed to manifest the physical characteristics in your life. Act out the part you wish to play. Cultivate the physical characteristics of the character that you wish to make your own. There is a good psychological principle involved in all of this. The principle that physical expressions of a mental state tended to reproduce that mental state. Just as it is true that thought takes form in action, so it is true that there is a reaction whereby the physical action reproduces the mental state which it represents. Endeavor to walk, talk, look, and act like the character you wish to be yours. Do this gradually, and you will soon be surprised to find that you are building yourself a new personality, without and within. Number three, endeavor to dwell in the desired mental state as much as possible. Try to feel the desired mental state as often as possible. Cultivate the desired feeling and to travel over the new mental path as often as possible. You will find that this rule first, or excuse me, you will find that this rule fits in well with the preceding one. For just as the outward expression induces the inner feeling, so does the inner feeling induce the outward action. 
Japan. So you see, one produces the other, and then the latter reproduces the first, and so on, until you have started an endless chain of cause and effect that will soon build your new mental path if you stick to it and do not allow yourself to be sidetracked. Number four, avoid the repetition of the undesirable habit with all of your will, determination, and individuality. While you are building up your new path, try to keep your mind off the old one as much as possible. Do not indulge the old habit just this once. Here is where you must make your fight. Avoid this just this once as you would a deadly viper. This is the danger point to be avoided. If you feel strongly tempted to repeat the old habit, here is your best chance to start in and perform an act along the lines of your new habit. This is much better than a straight will fight, for it accomplishes more with less exertion and effort. Make it a point to perform the new habit just when the temptation confronts you. You will then wound the enemy in his most vital point, and just when he un uncovers his weakest point to you. Like the shark and the gila monster, bad habits turn over on their backs to bite you, and in so doing they uncover their most vital point. Consequently, this is the time and place for you to plunge in your spear of the new habit and wound the monster sorely. Every time you do this and it defeated the enemy, the stronger do you become. Each time you overcome, you sap the energy from the enemy and turn it to good account. This is not mere preaching. It is the statement of a tried and a proven truth of the new psychology. Make it your own. Avoid, above all, the slipping back once you have started. Some writers have said that this slipping back on the path of new habits is like the dropping of a ball of yarn that you are winding up. In the drop, you allow more to unwind than you can rewind in many turns of the wrist. But if you should happen to drop the ball, don't give up. Pick it up and determinedly start to rewind it. But to try hard to avoid the dropping. You can, if you will. Chapter 10 will be Thought and Character.